today I'd like to talk about some of the treatments for myasthenia gravis. And we have several talks that sort of overlap a little today. Dr. Bird will be giving a talk focusing in on sort of the uh, rarer options, the options for refractory myasthenia. A little bit later, and Dr. Kell will be talking about thymectomy. So I'm going to focus more on a bit of an overview and try to get more into the nuts and bolts of some of the more commonly used medications and leave a lot of the detail on the more advanced and newer treatments to them. Uh, these are my disclosures. You own a pharmaceutical company. I'll get your name here at a reasonable rate. Um, so uh, as we all know, myasthenia is the most common autoimmune disease affecting communication between nerve and muscle and is actually one of the most logical and best understood autoimmune diseases because it makes so much sense how the antibodies, say to the acetylcholine receptor, even to musk, would cause patients' symptoms. Okay. So here's a nice picture showing again that you have the um, nervous system trying to make your muscle contract and it releases this chemical called acetylcholine. And this is how all the muscles in your body work. As the nerve reaches over to them, when the nervous system says go, it will release a little pulse of acetylcholine onto the muscle. The muscle has these acetylcholine receptors packed in, this area called the neuromuscular junction, and they're just waiting for a signal. And they'll create an electrical signal in the muscle fiber which will then zip down, activate the entire muscle fiber inside and out electrically, and then there'll be a chemical reaction in the muscle to cause it to twitch. So the idea is each time your nervous system says twitch, the muscle will twitch. And it should work with close to 100% reliability. And the way you control all of the muscles in your body is by recruiting different groups of muscle fibers to twitch at different rates. When a muscle's relaxed, it's not doing much of anything. To get a little bit of force, you have some of the fibers activate and fire at a certain rate. As you recruit progressively more force, you get more muscle fibers firing faster and faster, bringing in the biggest and strongest ones last, the weakest ones first, so you can precisely control how much strength you have. And the whole system should work very, very reliably unless there's a problem like myasthenia gravis. Here again, another picture showing how you have to release this chemical and how you have to have these receptors, these acetylcholine receptors all lined up there, ready to receive it and ready to generate a signal. Of course, every signal has to have something that makes it stop. So you have this little molecular machine here called acetylcholinesterase that Dr. Gill was talking about this morning, little molecular Pac-Man that will chew up the acetylcholine. So it gets released, get a nice burst of activity in the muscle, then you chew it up so that it goes away, it ends the activity, and the muscle will just constantly be making new versions of this, packaging it into little particles and then releasing them as needed. So the symptoms many of you are probably already familiar with are overwhelmingly symptoms of fatigable weakness. And this means something very specific to a neurologist. It doesn't just mean I feel tired and I feel weak, though patients do feel those things. It means that the patient can objectively become weaker with continuous or sustained activity. So the test Dr. Gill was discussing about where we might have you look up and keep looking up and try to hold your eyes up and then they might observe whether the eyelids weaken, where they might have you hold your arms up and then your neurologist would come and push and they would have you keep your arms extended for a period of time. Normally, this will make your shoulders burn a little bit if you're out of shape, but you should remain strong for a good minute, whereas in myasthenia, you might well observe a patient becoming weaker over the time that you're observing them. Um, eye manifestations, of course, very common, as we discussed before. In some patients, the symptoms will be purely confined to the eyes. In many, that will just be one of the more prominent symptom clusters. As we can see here, many patients will generalize, but if you don't within the first three years, you're unlikely to later. I think we're 
sort of stuck here. So we'll do it the old-fashioned way. OK. So as we were discussing before, many patients will have the most profound symptoms earlier, uh, later in the day, feeling relatively rested and recharged in the morning or after sleeping, then the symptoms building up over time. It's very important to note that about 10% of people have this tumor in the thymus that caused the myasthenia gravis. The thymus is a gland right under the sternum, and it's part of your immune system. It's sort of like where certain cells in the immune system go to school. Cells are born, and they have to learn what to attack. They have to decide what to attack. And then we have to say, well, you're a good immune cell. You're going to help us fight off viruses or bacteria. Or you're kind of a useless immune cell. We don't have any use for you. Go away. Or you're a bad immune cell. You're attacking something natural to the body. We need to delete you. You need to not go on. That's where a lot of this happens. And if you have a tumor there, that whole process can become broken. And then you have cells that should be deleted, cells that are going to make antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor, make antibodies to musk, where normally the, immune, the developing immune system would say, oh, wait, no, 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 you're no good. You're attacking our own body. We're going to delete you. And this process can break down if you have a thymic tumor. In other patients, there are evidence of sort of abnormalities in this gland that's not really a full-blown tumor. It's extremely important to look. Everybody with a new diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, uh, particularly the acetylcholine receptor positive group or the so-called seronegative group, must have a test for thymoma. Um, anyone here in the have a thymoma or did? Right. One of the other things about uh, thymoma is that patients can have other different autoimmune problems as well, sometimes overlapping. They need to be very careful with these patients that you're not missing a second autoimmune process. For instance, sometimes I'll have a patient who have myasthenia gravis with myositis, with actual attack on the muscle itself, not just the neuromuscular junction. Or you might have a patient who had encephalitis with an attack on the brain, because the usual rules of parsimony where patients tend to have just one disease at a time can break down a little bit here. OK, so um, good. As uh, Dr. Brandesma just discussed uh, very eloquently before, there are lists of drugs that you shouldn't receive if you have myasthenia gravis. The um, foundation has uh, their great um, pamphlets you can print out off the internet, lists of drugs to review. And it's often worth looking to remind your doctor uh, of your diagnosis as you're getting a drug and to ask so that they double check. Doctors are only human and often need a little prompting to do the best things to say, wait, is this antibiotic we're going to give you an aminoglycoside potentially going to cause trouble with your myasthenia. Also to think, if you were just started on a new medication and suddenly your myasthenia is seeming worse and worse over the next couple days, wait, is this a, one of those drugs that I shouldn't have? Is this potentially problematic for me? So always keep that in mind. OK, so um, great. So there are obviously a lot of different things that your doctor might have to think about that could look like myasthenia that aren't. There are many other diseases, for instance, that could cause weakness in the eyes or misalignment of the eyes. I don't think we want to go into too much detail there. And of course, the differential for limb weakness is quite large. There are many diseases of the nerve or muscle that could look a little like myasthenia gravis. Um, symptoms like fatigue, of course, there's thousands of things that could cause fatigue. So it often requires these other symptoms to really get to the right diagnosis. Dr. Gill, I think, uh, made a very good point this morning, pointing out if you go to your doctor and you say, I feel tired and weak, there's a thousand things that cause that. So it may well take time before one of the rare diseases like myasthenia gravis can be definitively diagnosed as they work through other more common problems. OK. So one of the things that you're probably familiar with by now is that your doctors want to keep an eye on your symptoms. And there isn't any lab test that your doctor can get that will tell them how you're doing. How you're doing will overwhelmingly be determined by how you're doing. It will be, first of all, you coming in and talking about symptoms. And some of the main symptoms they'll be asking about are double vision, trouble keeping the eyes open, how often, how much. Very important for them to look. They'll look carefully at your eye movements, your lid strength in your eyes, strength in your face. They'll ask about breathing. A great test that I love to do with my patients is to have them take a deep breath and count as high as they can on one breath. Has anyone done that with your doctor? Right. 
Again, if you're very mild, they might not think it's necessary if you don't have any respiratory problems. This test is a crude approximation of how much air you're holding in your lungs. Each 10 numbers you can say loudly and clearly corresponds to about a liter of lung capacity. So if you're, say, a healthy, normal-sized adult, you might count to 50. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, and you don't cheat, right? But you should be able to get up pretty high. And this is actually a very good test and something you might want to learn to do because it allows the doctor to measure your lung capacity. And this is, of course, the crucial symptom for bringing patients into the hospital. If I have a patient, I sometimes I get a call, I call them up, how are you doing? How are your symptoms? They might say, I'm feeling a little more tired. And I say, well, count for me. You know? And if a patient's counting 40, 50, and I know that they're, they're there all the time, I'm not worried. If I get a patient who's counting 20, or they're running out of breath sometime 20 or 30, I knew they previously were counting 40 or 50, I'd be much more concerned. Um, and yes? Okay. So OPMD is oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. It's a form of sort of congenital genetic muscle disease that can affect a lot the eyes and the face. The differences would be the symptoms probably don't fluctuate nearly as much in OPMD, but would gradually come on and progress throughout the person's lifespan, whereas myasthenia is much more of an on and off fluctuating disease changing rapidly across the course of the day. That would be an important clue. The nature of the weakness looks a little bit different with the fatigable quality being more pronounced in myasthenia. Of course, the lab tests and the electrophysiology are what will really get you precisely to the right answer. So um, anyway, so other things that your doctors will check in addition to breathing, neck strength, they'll ask about swallowing, they'll test strength in your arms and legs, and look sometimes for evidence of fatigue. Um, antibodies such as the acetylcholine receptor antibody, the musk antibody, extremely helpful at arriving at the correct diagnosis, but unfortunately not something where we can check a blood test and tell how you're doing. We could get a blood test of the acetylcholine receptor antibodies and the result would bounce around, depends on the lab, depends on the method, depends on the time of day. We could do it by the same exact lab and the same exact method, and if we sent the test every day for a week, we'd get a slightly different result. It means absolutely nothing. So never get too focused on that in terms of management. Um, the electrodiagnostic test, likewise, not really something we can use on a practical level to, to sort of uh, treat people. Okay, so um, one of the th uh, points that Dr. Gill made before is very important is that musk myasthenia and antibodies to acetylcholine receptor myasthenia are different. The antibodies to musk are this type of antibody called an IgG4 which won't fix complement, which means certain treatments might work differently. There are now at least 10 IgG4-mediated neurological diseases, some with antibodies to things in the brain, some with antibodies to things in nerve or other tissues. Um, they, in general, tend to respond pretty well to treatments like rituximab. They would never respond to treatments that are designed to block the complement system like echolizumab, and they might not respond quite the same way to treatments like IVIG, just because of the way these antibodies work. Um, here's this little cartoon. The main point is that this receptor, which here is a little pentagon, in the membrane is held in place by a whole group of other proteins that all work together like a team to get it there, to regulate how many of the receptors they are, how many active they are, to keep them in precisely the right place. So you can have antibodies not just to the receptor itself, but to other things like musk or potentially agarin in a small subset of patients that will um, help to localize a receptor that could all potentially cause myasthenia gravis. As a practical matter, of course, acetylcholine receptor antibodies are just the most common thing, musk the second, and then some of these other things seem to be quite rare. It's important to note that some of these things are on the outside of the cell and some are on the inside of the cell. And one of the rules for antibodies is that in order to cause disease, they have to target things on the outside. They can't really get at things in the inside. So some of these things, you really can't have a great autoimmune disease for. Now, almost every one of these things could be targeted by 
genetic disease, right? If you have a flaw in any of these proteins on a genetic basis, that would be a congenital myasthenic syndrome. Okay, so um, musk antibody positive myasthenia, as we were talking about before, heavily female predominant, a lot of sort of above the neck, head, face, eye symptoms. There's really no association with the thymus or with thymoma here, which is very interesting. Um, tend to respond not as well to the acetylcholine receptor inhibitors like mestinon and rituximab may be a particular good choice for this whole category of uh, IgG4 type antibodies. So we're always interested in checking patients for thymoma. Almost always it will be the myasthenia that will allow us to find the thymoma, not the other way around. 90 5% plus of the time. Patients don't come in being treated for a thymoma and then all of a sudden get myasthenia. That can happen, but it's extremely rare. It's almost always a patient doesn't know they have it, little tumor that hadn't caused any symptoms yet except for the myasthenia. Okay, good. So um, thymectomy, as Dr. Gill discussed, we do now have a study showing um, benefit to thymectomy in terms of requiring less treatment over time in terms of being more likely that you'll go into remission. This is going to be one of these things where you will pay an upfront price of having to have a surgery, which depending on how they do it, they might have to crack the sternum, which is a big deal, especially if you're already having some respiratory weakness. But then there's a long-term potential benefit in terms of requiring less steroids and fewer other treatments going ahead, being more likely to have a good remission. Whoops. Okay. So, um, of course, the Dr. Gill's study where they finally gathered up enough patients to do a large analysis. Keep in mind, this applied to patients under the age of 60, but that they were adults, that they were acetylcholine receptor antibody positive uh, patients, not musk patients. Um, one of the big sort of asterisks on this study is that the medications we're using, like echolizumab and rituximab, are changing, they're evolving pretty rapidly. This study was done mostly before those were fully available, before those were in widespread use. So the question is, does it still apply, right? Or is it, as we get better medical treatments, do we still need to have a thymectomy? Anyway, Dr. Kella has a whole talk on this issue. Here is just, just some slides from the study showing patients more likely to go into uh, remission or to have improvements in their scores, of uh, their exam scores, and require less steroids going ahead over time if they've had a thymectomy compared to not. So it's still an option to consider, but we have to keep in mind where we are in five or 10 years, we may have to reconsider the whole notion as newer medical treatments become available. Okay, good. So, um, good. So, Big question is whether it still makes sense for ocular myasthenia. Um, musk, probably it doesn't make sense. And keep in mind the age of the patients as well. So let's talk a little about symptomatic treatment of myasthenia. Often one of the first things that someone would reach for in a patient with myasthenia is um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, such as prudostigmine or mestinon. And these drugs do not address the underlying problem, right? They don't do anything about your antibody levels. They don't do anything about the immune system. All they do is try to chemically compensate for this lack of acetylcholine transmission at the neuromuscular junction, to boost the amount of acetylcholine to overcome the problem the antibodies are causing, to compensate for it. Um, by preventing breakdown of acetylcholine, they allow the acetylcholine's release to last a little longer. And if your receptors are not functioning right, there's not quite enough of them in the right places because of antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor, this treatment may allow more to compensate for that, more effective transmission, more likely that the muscle will twitch when you tell it to twitch, meaning a greater strength and less fatigue. The drug lasts for a pretty short period of time, usually three to four hours. There's a longer lasting time span medication that can be used overnight. Um, it's important to think of this treatment as something that comes in and comes out very quickly. There isn't really any long lasting effect for good 
But on the other hand, the side effects are also going to be very short-lasting with this drug as well. It's, there's not really a prolonged cost you're paying for being on this drug. If you take this drug for 10 years and then you stop for a day, it's like you never had it, right? There's, there's not like a long-term health consequence you're paying for that. On the other hand, you didn't get any long-term benefit with the disease either. You just reduce symptoms while you were taking it. Okay. So um, uh, most commonly taken is an oral form. There is an IV form mostly used for the Tensilon test that isn't particularly practical in terms of treatment. And the question is, how much mestinon can you take, which varies a lot from patient to patient. Because it's turning up acetylcholine transmission in your body, that's also used for other things, making tears, saliva, controlling the mobility of your GI tract, sweating, controlling how your pupils restrict, controlling your heart rate. All of these can be affected to some extent by the mestinon. On a practical level, the main thing people will notice as a side effect is diarrhea, right? Increased um, abdominal motility and secretions will cause more and more bowel movements, and that's often sort of the limiting factor. It varies a lot from patient to patient how much they can take. And as you're going up, you may find that there's a limit, most patients do, and that they need to pull back below that in order to be comfortable. Now, there are a bunch of treatments you can use to try to compensate for this, glycopyrrolate or um, emodium to try to decrease GI motility, but there's usually a sort of a limit to what each patient can take. Okay, um, patients might also notice things like sweating, sometimes cramps um, being the side effect of this medication, though almost always it's the intestinal side effects that are limiting what you can do. Okay, so what are the advantages? Well, you're not paying a long-term price for being on this medicine. You could take it for 10 years and then you just stop it and it hasn't cost you anything. The side effects that occur, they occur and then they stop as soon as you stop the medication. The disadvantage is the effectiveness varies a lot from patient to patient. It usually gives you a bit of a boost in terms of strength, in terms of eye movements. If you have mild myasthenia, it might be all that you need. But if your myasthenia is more severe, it just might not be enough. You might not be able to tolerate um, enough to get the full benefit. Here again, some of the treatments we can use to try to deal with these GI side effects, which again, might allow you to take a bit more, but there's always a ceiling and there's generally a limit to how good you can get with this. Okay, so next up, beating on the immune system. And the main question a neurologist is thinking of when you're in the office with them is, how big a stick do I need to beat their immune system with at this time? What's the appropriate thing to use? Uh, steroids um, being the quick acting, um, sort of an oldest thing we use is quite reliable. And then other slower acting oral medications and some rarer, newer things. So let's go through them. So steroids almost always come up in treatment. Um, they cause significant improvement in about 75% of patients. If steroids had no side effects, our treatment of myasthenia would just be like, here, take 100 milligrams of prednisone and uh, you know, have a nice life and don't worry about it. And it would work for the great majority of patients. However, steroids are quite serious in terms of affecting many, many different things inside the body. So first of all, in terms of benefit, it will gradually kick in, not like the minute you take it, but over days and weeks. And most of the benefit will be achieved within a, you know, four weeks or so. Um, I would think on sometimes faster than that. You can use them in pregnancy if necessary. Um, some patients can transiently worsen as the levels put on. So you do need to be cautious when you're first initiating steroids. Some doctors prefer an approach where they sort of dial it up a bit gradually at first, um, but then they'll almost always be a benefit to the patient in the long term. And then the question is, how much do you need at any given time to stay strong? And often there'll be this period where the patient comes in, you don't know, we start you on a good high dose, we try to get the symptoms under control, and then we're dialing down deliberately, making an adjustment, seeing how the patient does, making an adjustment, and often you'll be going back and forth with your doctor over the phone um, as the dose is lowered. And the main question is, where's your number gonna be? And this disease, it's almost like there's a magical invisible number at any given time of how much steroids any given patient needs to be doing pretty well. And you don't really know where that is until you go below it and the symptoms will come up. So there's often this slow dial down. And then the question is, where are you? Are you at say five milligrams a day, 10 milligrams a day, where the symptoms are pretty mild, where the side effects are pretty mild? 
or is it a patient who's requiring a lot of treatment, 30, 40 milligrams a day? This will be a major factor in determining how enthusiastic your doctor is for trying other treatments, trying to add on different things. If a patient's only requiring five milligrams of prednisone a day, your enthusiasm for adding on other treatments is much lower than if they're requiring 30, 40, especially if that patient is not tolerating it very well. So what are the side effects? Well, first of all, steroids are essential for life. Everyone in this room has steroids in your body. If you have no steroids in your body, you go into a coma, you get very sick, right? You need some amount of steroids. Your adrenal glands produce them all the time. If you take a lot of steroids, your adrenal glands, they kind of check the wind and they say, there's a ton of steroids here. I don't need to do anything. I'm going to sleep, right? Now, this wouldn't happen in a day, but if you're on steroids for a month or two, your adrenal glands are going to sleep. And then if you lower down enough, they'll wake back up and they'll start making almost always. But you do need to be careful. You should never be on a high dose of steroids for a significant period of time and just suddenly quit cold turkey. Running out of it could get you into big trouble. Patient goes away on a week-long cruise, they forget their steroids, they need to talk to the ship doctor and get some or they're going to wind up in trouble. This is regardless of whether you had myasthenia or not. You could have no medical problem at all. They could have been given to you for a terrible reason and you suddenly quit cold turkey, you could become quite ill. So you always need to coordinate with your doctors as you're lowering down the steroids. If you go into the hospital, you need to tell people very clearly that you're on steroids. Um, you would not want a situation where there's a sloppy admission where the, the, they don't realize you're on that, you have an operation, you're not able to answer questions, you don't ask about it, you don't get steroids for a couple of days, especially if you had an operation, that would be very unfortunate. Uh, don't do that. So you need to come off. Um, any patient of mine who wants to be off, I'll always, of course, abide by their wishes and get them off, but I'd work with them to do it in a safe way, to come down gradually enough to allow the adrenal glands to wake back up, to make sure they're waking up, to watch the patient for any signs that they're getting jittery, shaky, or weak as you're coming off. Um, to make sure you're not winding up in trouble. Um, if you don't have enough steroids in your body, suddenly you could get weakness, nausea, vomiting, lethargy, and so on. Okay, so other things. Steroids can weaken your bones. This is a sort of dose and time thing. If you're at five milligrams a day for a short period of time, it's not much of an issue. If you're at 40 or 50, 60 milligrams a day for years, it's gonna become a major issue. Steroids tend to turn up how quickly your body chews up vitamin D, which you need to maintain bone health. Patients on significant doses of steroids might want to ask about vitamin D. You might want to ask your doctor periodically, should you get a bone scan? Check up on your bone health. If there's osteoporosis developing, should that be addressed? Usually if, say, you're a 30-year-old man, osteoporosis just isn't even on your doctor's radar screen. But if you're taking a lot of steroids, well, it should be. Right? They need to worry about your bone health and keep an eye on it. Weight gain, major side effect with steroids. Prednisone tends to make people hungry. It makes it very hard to lose weight, to maintain a healthy weight. It's important to do the best you can, but it can be a real problem. You have to watch out for diabetes or worsening blood sugar. If you already have diabetes, you need to be particularly careful to monitor sugars carefully to coordinate with the doctors treating your diabetes to keep it under control. Even if you don't have diabetes, sometimes blood sugar could be checked. Wound healing at higher doses can be a bit slower. Sleep, it tends to wind people up. Your body's natural rhythm is actually produce a burst of steroids early in the morning. I usually suggest to my patients to take the prednisone when they first wake up in the morning as it's more natural. It can cause insomnia, especially if you're like a person who wants to take your pills at 10 at night. Um, it can make it really hard for you to go to sleep. These things all vary a lot from person to person. There are rare patients who can become flat out psychotic on high dose steroids. It's extremely low percentage of the population, but it can happen. So of course, Keep an eye on uh, your mood as you have changes in this medication. Okay, so some of the slower immune therapies, things like Cellcept, which is not that well supported by clinical trials. This is a drug that's used in cancer rejection. Um, you'll need to have blood tests to monitor um, your blood counts to make sure you're not getting anemic or not having drops in your cell counts. There's a low risk that you could develop a secondary tumor from it. The effects... Um, probably kick in very gradually over many months, right? So you can't just take this and say, oh, and then I'll be off steroids in a month or two months. It doesn't work like that. So it's probably kicking in very gradually. This is sort of the opposite of mestinon. It kicks in very slowly. The benefits are long-lasting, but potential side effects are long-lasting as well. Um, two randomized control trials. 
that did not turn out very well. Many of us still think it can be effective. It still can be a good choice for some patients, but the overall data for efficacy is not great. Okay, azathioprine, Imuran, another one of these sort of anti-rejection medications, kicks in very gradually and suppresses the immune system. Um, it's demonstrated to be effective um, in myasthenia gravis. Um, you do need to check this enzyme that chews up the drug before you take it, because there's a certain percentage of people who do not metabolize this drug properly, and you need to be very careful with them. Um, maybe one in 300 people won't, uh, won't be safe for them. So this is one of the newer things. In the old days, we didn't know about it. We just take our chances. The onset of action in the trials was very slow. It's only gradually kicking in, gradually suppressing the immune system. You'll need to be on labs. You'll need to be monitored while you're taking this medication. Um, main side effects, lower blood counts, abnormal liver tests. Some people get a flu-like reaction. There may be a small risk in certain cancers, but it's not totally clear in patients with myasthenia gravis. And we need to check labs to make sure the patient you're dealing with it okay to forestall any problems. So with respect to cell sets, so the randomized clinical trials did not show- Did not meet their endpoint, yeah. So is it because the trial is not set up correctly or the drug or the, it's just- yeah, all, all you can say is, the, the trial did not, defect, did not detect the effect that they were looking for the way they conducted it. Now the question is, if you did a different trial, larger trial, you designed it differently, might you get an effect? You might, but you really can't make a scientific statement about that, right? So the, the evidence we have, it didn't work in that studies, but that doesn't show it doesn't work. That just shows that they couldn't get it to work, you know, to the to degree they'd like in that particular design. Right, right. So the, the right. So we don't have clinical trial evidence for this drug. That's correct. Um, so azathioprine again, a small um, randomized trial showed um, effect that kicked in quite gradually in terms of patients needing less prednisone over time. And often the way they design these studies is they would have doctors treating the patients using the appropriate amount of steroids to keep them stable and then adding this on in a way that the doctors and the patients don't know who got it and who didn't. And then they would say, like, how much steroids you need and over time do you need less? Are your scores better? So they're, they're quite difficult um, to, to put these together, especially in a rare disease. Um, cyclosporin, uh, another immunosuppressive transplant type medication, similar situation. There was a gradual effect. This study, um, this study also showed that a significant number of people need to stop this medicine, though, because of effects on the kidneys. So this one will require careful monitoring. It tends not to be used nearly as much, um, but can be used for some patients. Um, this uh, may come on a little bit faster than azathioprine, but we need to watch the kidneys, watch the blood pressure, and though unfortunately there are a lot of interactions with other medications, so it can be a bit tricky to use. Um, other effects, cytoxan. This is basically an old school chemo drug. It kills rapidly dividing cells in the body and can have the effects that um, chemo would have then in terms of you know, hair loss, getting sores in the mouth, getting infections, weakening the immune system. It can actually damage the bladder. It needs to be delivered as monthly IV pulses with a lot of fluids afterwards to try to protect the bladder from this effect. Um, has serious effects on fertility. Most of these drugs, except for prednisone, you need to consider carefully um, pregnancy and birth control issues, um, especially in female patients. Um, tacrolimus, again, um, can affect the immune system. It's one of these transplant drugs and um, potentially could be effective, um, but we don't have great evidence about it. So some of the other therapies, and I think Dr. Bird's gonna go into this a great deal later, like rituximab, I'll just give you a little background. So what is rituximab? Rituximab is like a smart bomb. Your immune system is extremely complicated, has all these different parts to it. It's like the US Armed Forces. There's the Army and the Navy and the Marines and guys in like bombers and, and 
and your immune system is like that. They've got little cells that go Pac-Man bacteria and other cells that make antibodies and other cells that orchestrate um, what to do and cells that kill virally infected cells and all kinds of stuff. And rituximab is an antibody that's made to kill one particular part of your immune system, which are antibody cells at a certain stage in development. And they'll stop you from making new antibody making cells for about six months. Usually it's given as IV infusions, two or four doses, and then it continues to be active for about six months. Then it wears off and the immune system sort of reboots itself. The main side effects are you can have an allergic reaction when it goes in. There's some risk of infection. The interesting thing about this is patients do relatively well without this part of the immune system. And you say, why do they use this part of the immune system? You can make a theoretical argument that killing T cells would be even better, or killing these other cells would be real. These are the ones we can kill without killing you, right? So these are the ones where if you shut them down, most patients do very well. If you have an otherwise medically healthy patient, you put them on rituximab, particularly a young person, and they're not on any other powerful immune therapies, um, very, very likely you'd do fine. They could get, there's some risk of infection, but it's quite low. Particularly if you only did it for six or 12 months, it would be quite low. Whereas if you go take out other parts of the immune system, like if you take out T cells, if you take out all of someone's T cells for six months, they would have very severe AIDS for six months. They would get a ton of opportunistic infections. A lot of bad things would happen. So this is, again, why we use this medication um, more and more. Basically, it's setting the reset button on your antibody-making system, and there's a test that the doctor can do to watch it recover. Not everybody recovers perfectly, so there's some patients where their immune system is weakened longer term after getting this. Um, interesting thing in research, there's a doctor named Dr. Lindstrom who actually found acetylcholine receptors antibodies initially 40 years ago, doing fascinating work that's not been tried in humans where they try to trick the immune cell, immune cells that make acetylcholine receptor antibodies into making different types of antibodies instead, to make antibodies to the parts of the receptor that are inside of cells rather than outside so they can't be effective. Works great in rats. Humans, well, stay tuned. We'll see if they can get it to work in humans. This is the future, though, because right now, what are we doing? We're taking your immune system, we're just pound it down, like whack-a-mole, beep, 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 down, 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 less immune response, less down, 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 kill these cells, suppress those cells, stop those cells, shut down complement, shut down this, shut down that, right? It's very nonspecific, and we're, as a side effect, you're potentially gonna get infections, because they're like 99.9% .9 of what a myasthenics immune system is doing is good stuff that we want it to do, right? That we're, we're inhibiting that as a side effect. To go after that 0.001%, the one bad thing it's doing among all the good things it's doing. In the future, though, the treatment may be to get it to stop doing that one bad thing or to get it to do that one bad thing in a different way that doesn't harm you rather than just trying to beat the immune system down in general. So uh, maybe one of these uh, conferences we can get Dr. Lindstrom or his junior partner, Dr. Lowe, to come out and give a talk on this research because it's really fascinating. I think that's where the future is going to be. Okay, how are we doing on time? We okay? Okay, good. All right, so um, rapid therapy. So things... I was talking mostly about things you use in the office. You're going back and forth with your doctor. Here are some of the other things that might come up if someone gets into a crisis or gets into a jam, especially plasmapheresis and IVIG. So plasmapheresis, what is this? Well, the idea is we're going to wash out the bad antibodies. We put a big IV catheter into a big vein in the neck. You get hooked up to something like a dialysis machine, takes your blood out, runs it through the machine, keeps the antibodies, returns the rest of the fluid to you. That's plasmapheresis. What's good about it? It's really fast. You can do, say, a series of five exchanges over, uh, say, two weeks or so, and we can get circulating antibody levels of just about anybody antibody down about 97%, right? Well, that may be very good if someone's in a crisis. Well, what's not so great about this? The antibodies will come back as you make new ones. You haven't done anything to convince your body to make less antibodies. You just remove the product, and then more gets made. What else is bad about this? You need a big catheter in your neck. What's bad about that? Well, are you going to walk around with that indefinitely? What if we wanted to do this again and again? Well, that's a problem, right? Because if you leave a big IV in someone's neck, sooner or later you're going to have a pretty serious infection of this big IV line leading directly into the central part of the circulatory system. That's a problem. What if you're going to put one in and put one out and put one in and put one out every month? It tends not to be very practical either. 
That's pretty rough, right? Sometimes in a real jam, you might need to do it a few times, but just saying it's a long-term option, this isn't good. Well, what could we do to maybe get around that? Well, these are some of the things that Dr. Gill were mentioning before. We, uh, newer treatments where we can stop sort of the recycling of antibodies. So your own body's natural system is, you try to preserve them, you keep them around, they last for a long time, but what if you can just turn up your own body's recycling system and get rid of antibodies faster? That might be a much more elegant uh, solution. IVIG, we don't really know how IVIG works. I can point you a bunch of different papers, they all argue a little different things. It may interfere with the way bad antibodies access the complement system. It may cause some sort of feedback in terms of antibody production. It's not clear, right? We don't have great evidence about it, which is kind of embarrassing. But so how does this work? You get hooked up, you get a whole bunch of antibodies from normal blood donors. It tends to have a beneficial effect. Lasts for about four weeks and wears off. Well, so the maybe a little bit slower than plasmapheresis, but on the other hand, outpatient, it is practical. How many people are on sort of regular IVIG therapy? How many people on regular plasmapheresis? Yeah. Unusual situations, right? Sometimes we have to do difficult things, but you can see how much rarer that is because it is practical to do this on a regular basis and it's used for many treatments like CIDP. There are a whole infrastructure of companies to do it. Well, what's the downside? You can get a headache. There's always some risk of infection, though the companies are actually very clever. Like Griffles, Disclosure, they gave me a grant, but they, they describe their system, which I think is very interesting, of many of the companies will have these blood donors. They gather the, sam the blood, the serum from the blood donors, the antibodies, and they'll store it until the patient comes in the next time. And then they, when they recheck all their, they're checking each time them for hepatitis and HIV. And only when the second test comes back negative do they use the first sample, right? So they try to be very careful with this, but it, it is a blood product. So there's a risk of infection. There's a risk of this bad headache. There's a risk of some blood clots. Though some of the older formulations were much worse than the newer ones. So that's, um, IVIG for you. It is practical to do this repeatedly, as many of you are well aware, and can really help some patients in terms of reducing steroids. This is interesting because IVIG, either the bad thing happens or it doesn't. It's not like steroids, where steroids you are accumulating potentially problems over time, right? If I put someone on steroids for five years, I may have weakened their bones. I may have given them weight gain. I may have caused a problem with diabetes that I can't just undo that by stopping. Now, certainly it'd be easier to manage their weight once they're off, their diabetes might improve when they're off, but you could pay a price. IVIG, you either you got an infection or you didn't, nothing, or you got a blood clot or you didn't. And there's really not like a long-term price you're paying for this. Okay, so just an interesting thought about that. Anyway, that's all I had to say today, and I'll be glad to try to answer uh, your questions. I'd encourage those of you with a lot of questions about thymectomy to go to Dr. Kelly. He's going to do a whole talk about it. He's very knowledgeable about it. And Dr. Bird's got a great talk about some of the more advanced and exotic options. Um, so this is sort of the basics here. Yes? Right. Well, so it varies a lot um, depending on how stressed you, how, how much physical stress your body is on. Probably your natural production in adults is somewhere like the equivalent of five or ten milligrams of prednisone a day. Now, if you're like an ultra marathoner, it may well be much higher than that. If you're fasting, it will be higher than that. If you're just totally sedentary and doing nothing, it may be kind of low. That's sort of the, the natural production level, somewhere around five for many patients. So as you start going down and down there, it's probably they're, they're waking back up and starting to make it themselves. 